we serve a mighty God. A mighty God who has a great deal of patience with each one of us. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad for God's grace, his mercy, his compassion, and his patience? Amen. I don't think there is a person here that would stand without that. We, we need to remember from whence comes our strength, from whence comes our blessings. As people, there are many times when, spiritually speaking, we can be hard of hearing, and I point two fingers here. Sometimes we can be hard of hearing, slow to understand, unsure of what to say in the scenarios that God ultimately places us in. And our humanness can blind us to what God wants to accomplish in and through us sometimes. Individually and collectively, this can happen. In Mark, we see Jesus very patiently teaching his disciples the truth about how, who he is, about what his purposes are, and, and how all of them fit into the big picture. And over and over again, we see Jesus doing miracles. The miracles of Christ were driven by compassion to relieve human suffering. But ultimately, Jesus used these miracles to teach his disciples about the very nature and heart of their God in relation to his far-reaching eternal purposes. Now, after healing the deaf and the tongue-tied men that was spoken of in, in uh, Mark chapter 7 last week, excitement again began to build in the people. And uh, they undoubtedly were again thinking about making him king so that he could set up his physical kingdom in accordance with their understanding of what Messiah would do. But this was not the Lord's plan. This was not the Lord's interest at that time. Jesus had come for other purposes. And this is why Jesus was telling the people who witnessed the healings that he was performing not to broadcast what he had done for them. But it seems over and over he told people this to no avail. Now I think if we were honest with ourselves, we can admit that despite that we walk with the Lord and witness the good and sometimes incredible, miraculous things that he does, we too can get his purposes wrong. In our flesh, we can think that we know what he wants to do and we end up taking our eyes off what Jesus is trying to tell us and get focused on what's going on according to our five senses. We try to make sense of it all and fit into our idea of how things should be, the things that we think should happen. But in the end, we find out that God actually has other plans. And like those original disciples, we, much, we have much to learn sometimes. And that learning takes place through repeated lessons. <laughs> and we're subjected, as God's children, we're subjected to spiritual wars that we cannot possibly hope to overcome in our own strength. We're often so hard at spiritual hearing, slow to spiritual learning and unable to recognize what God wants to do. And this is where we pick up in the story of Jesus here and his disciples this week, Jesus and his disciples, again, they, they leave this area after healing the man who couldn't speak and, and hear properly. They leave this area again where this excitement was stirring over the miracle of this healed man, and they set off to a remote place again. And they went towards the hill country on the Sea of Galilee, near the borderlands with the lands of the Gentiles. And I know John spoke somewhat about the lands of the Gentiles and the Jews and, and, the, and the different, the, the Hellenistic Jews and, the, and the, uh, the traditional Jews in that area, traditional believing Jews. 
He talked about that. But the crowds were pressing in on Jesus. They wanted to make him king. So he withdrew again with his disciples for some reprieve, some time alone where he could pour into his disciples. And again, we see the people following him around the Sea of Galilee, and this is where today's message picks up again. You see, I believe that God, sometimes, when there's a lesson that's so important for us to get, he reinforces that lesson through repetition. Sometimes, (laughs) Mr. Blockhead here doesn't quite get it the first time around. You ever find that? God takes you around, and then sometimes around again, and around again to the same place, because as humans, we can be pretty, I guess, closed to what he's trying to do, and he, he, he makes a point here. So here we are, Mark chapter 8, starting with verse 1. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Some people have confused this story. And they said, this is just a repetition of the same miracle. Uh, Someone got their wires crossed here sometime. Uh, You know, just when you think you've seen it all. Jesus revisits the same scenario that he presented with the feeding of the 5,000. These are two separate incidents. This isn't the one same incident and someone got confused along the way. No, these are two separate incidents. And when you've seen it all, when you think you've seen it all, he does it again. People again followed around the shoreline to this remote place where Jesus and his disciple had sailed. And, and Jesus began ministering to the people who came to see him right away. And why? Because he was compassionate towards them. Friends, Our Lord Jesus Christ is a master teacher. He helped his listeners understand and remember his teachings. And one of the ways he does this, and he did it in this occasion, is through repetition. He taught the same major themes again and again. And in this case, he duplicated a significant miracle for the second time. As was the case case with the miracle of the 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000. In this scene, the 4,000 people who came to him were desperate. They were desperate for a touch from God. Matthew chapter 15, verses 30 and 31, brings clarity to the scene here. And this is what it says about this four, the setting of the 4,000 miracle, the four, feeding of the 4,000. We read, Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the cripple made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus had compassion upon these people. They were suffering and were desperate for physical healing. In this world, we suffer. Maybe not now, but If you haven't suffered, you're going to. That's the nature of of the physical realm that we're in. And and these people were suffering, and they were desperate for physical healing. They knew that Jesus was a miracle worker and that he was making big differences in, in people's lives, and they wanted him to work miracles by curing them of their physical ailments, just as he had shown that he was capable of doing it in others. As often is the case with us, when any of us approach the Lord, these people, their senses were burning. Their focus became pivotal on the present circumstances of their physical ailments. And it was true. Jesus understood the suffering of these ailments. And what does it say here? He looked upon them 
with compassion. He had compassion. But they didn't really understand the totality of the big picture of what Jesus was primarily concerned with. Jesus knew these people were longing for wholeness. God knew that they were longing for wholeness. God could see the brokenness of the people where they are with the effects of sin that had come down from Adam. For this reason, Jesus came to to show people who he was like, to show them what God's heart was like. He had compassion upon them. But he had a bigger picture in mind. When we look at the brokenness and suffering around us, it Sin is brought into the world through disease and through calamity and through all the stuff that we see. (laughs) Don't we long for wholeness? We do. We long for wholeness. And God sees us where we are, and and He has compassion upon us. But one thing's certain here. God doesn't look at things through the same set of lenses that Humans do. God God looks at things through the lens of eternity. And and he knows that there's brokenness here and now, but he hasn't abandoned us to our suffering. See, what the people didn't understand is that Jesus, in this circumstance here, performed these physical miracles and met these physical needs primarily to point to the fact that He is Lord over all of eternity. In in eternity, He has the final say on how the story is going to end. And and even His disciples, who, who walked the closest with Him, they had a hard time understanding the Lord's ultimate plan. They too had a hard time Understanding the, the fact that what they were experiencing in the five senses was not the ultimate end of things. They couldn't help it sometimes, right? Their flesh cried out. Their five senses were crying out. It was time for them to understand for Jesus to reinforce with them again what he had been trying to show them through the miracle of the 5,000. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus, I find this, when we read this passage, isn't it interesting that the circle, the inner circle of disciples, they found themselves questioning Jesus about how they would find enough bread for all of these people. When just days before this, They had seen a similar need and they were witnesses to one of the greatest miracles of all time, the feeding of more than 5,000 people. And in that case, it was 5,000, not including women and children. So we're looking at a crowd, possibly 10,000 people. This is a miracle of similar magnitude to the children of Israel coming up to the Red Sea and seeing the waters part in the Red Sea for safe passage for them to the other side. My friends, sometimes we can be blinded by the big picture through the immediate crisis of the suffering that is looming before us or the need that is before us. It's easy for us to be distracted, isn't it? And to forget who stands beside us in the middle of it all. It's like the Israelites, when they were traveling through the desert, God showed that he was with them by displaying a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. He led them and God took care of them and he parted the Red Sea and he destroyed their enemies and gave them water from the rock and provided manna and quail for them to eat. But they still didn't understand because in the desert, it wasn't pleasant. In the desert, it was, there was suffering. It was still hot and parched and dry. And yes, banana bread every day. Banana bread. They, they looked at it and they were like, 
God, we, gotta, we need relief from this. And, and there, the heat, you know, I remember being in the Sinai Desert when I was in Israel, and it was, I don't know, they said it was over 50 degrees when we were there. And, you know, I put suntan lotion on my head, and it melted and went into my eyes, and I suffered even worse. It was horribly hot. It was so hot. I mean, we had a hot summer last year. This was unbelievably hot. And I was thinking to myself, there is no air conditioning in this place. These Israelites who wandered through the desert, they were suffering in this. Even though God provided for them, they still were in this test and trial. In this world, you will have troubles. Guaranteed, you will suffer. But God is with you through your suffering. He is standing beside you. Take comfort in this. It is just a little while. But our human nature, it's so difficult to work through. In our human nature, we're just so slow to to see, to hear, to understand that Jesus is actually Lord over everything. And in the end, we don't have to worry about the outcomes because the outcomes belong to God and they're in his hands and he is good. His eternal purposes are, are awesome. We can't even begin to fathom the wonderful things that God has in store for those that are his children. And I know when we're in the middle of the desert, we're in the middle of the suffering. It doesn't feel that good. Those disciples here in this story, they struggled with spiritual blindness and deafness. Had the crisis of the hungry people that now stood before them, made them completely forget the lessons that were just taught to them of the feeding of the 5,000? Apparently so. But before we get too hard on them, it's good for us to recognize in ourselves the times that we are the same way as they are. I ask myself this, how many times have I forgotten the miracles of the Lord, of where he has taken me from, of what he has done, and where I stand today. Have I forgotten sometimes? Yes, I have. Can you identify with what I've been saying here? We're all alike. We all face this. Thankfully, God is very patient with us in our slowness to understand We need reminders because our attention is so quickly diverted by our circumstances. Reminds me of a song that Melody Green once wrote. And Keith Green's one of my favorite artists out there, always will be. And he says this, he says, and when Keith sings it, he just sings it from the spirit, you know, just... Melody wrote this. I, might, I, I make my life a prayer to you. I only want to do what you want me to. And then he goes on, and I won't say the whole song because it'd take a while. But he says, this is what, he says, I want to thank you now for being patient with me. Oh, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. I'll, I guess I'll have to trust and just believe what you say. Because you're coming again. Coming to take me away. Brother Keith's in the presence of Jesus right now. You guys know the story, possibly. If you haven't, he died with a, one of his children in a plane crash. But he's with Jesus. His wife still carries on some of the ministry. But the truth, you see, is that Jesus has an eternal plan for each of our lives and a solution to every problem. And he calls us to place our trust in him today, to cast your cares upon you, me. That's what Jesus says, because I care for you. So we go back to this miracle. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and had said to his disciples, to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. 
he gave thanks for them and also told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he sent them away, he got in the boat with his disciples and went off to the region of Dalmanutha. Now, in both the great feeding miracles that Jesus performed, he was able to meet the need even though there was very little to offer him. Have you got very little to offer to God today? That's okay. God knows that we have needs. And God knows that we have very little to offer. He knows we can't offer much. But as his disciples, he asks us to bring us, to bring him what we have and set what we have been given before him and be willing to share it with others. You see, the lesson in this, in the two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, the meeting of the 4,000, the feeding of the 4,000 rather, um, Jesus is big enough for any of our expectations and there is more than enough provision in him to surpass those expectations. He's ultimately Lord over eternity. And Jesus repeated a physical miracle to reinforce a spiritual truth. See, it is in him to be able to uh, abundantly meet us with even more than what we need. See, after the 5,000 were fed, the disciples were asked to collect the leftovers. And what did they collect? They collected 12 basketfuls of broken pieces left over. In that miracle, the 12 basketfuls left over demonstrates that God offers more than enough life-giving provision for all of the people of Israel. More than enough to supply the needs of all 12 tribes. And the second lesson Jesus gives us in this reinforcing miracle, you see, they brought him seven loaves. Seven represents completeness. Seven loaves. And how many basketfuls were collected after they were all fed? Seven. See, not only does Jesus have enough provisions to meet the needs of all of the children of Israel, but he has more than enough provision to meet the needs of all of God's children, the totality of God's children. The second miracle were seven basketfuls left over, suggesting that he has enough to meet the spiritual needs of all the people, including the Gentile world, including you and me. Seven represents the completeness of God. There are seven days in creation. Just consider this. The final being the Sabbath day of rest. There are seven days in the week. There are seven primary colors visible in the spectrum of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Throughout Scripture, the number seven is found in contexts involving the completeness of divine protection. We see in Exodus, you know, it's commanded for animals at least uh, seven days old before they were used as a sacrifice. Um, Elijah's command for the leprous uh, official from another kingdom, Naaman, to dip himself, submerse himself in the Jordan River seven times before he was cleansed, completely cleansed. The Lord's command for Joshua is to march around Jericho for seven days in succession, and on the seventh day he was to march seven times around the city before the Spirit of God came down and the walls fell, and a great victory was won. The Bible tells us that there are seven candlesticks on the Jewish menorah. 
The totality of the earth is comprised of seven continents. And in Revelation, Jesus writes his letters to the seven churches representing the seven types of churches throughout the ages. In these instances, seven signifies a completion of some kind. A divine mandate is fulfilled in sevens. The seven basketfuls that were left over have significance representing the fact that God had enough provision for all of his people from all continents, in all nations, in all ages, throughout history, including ours. Seven represents totality in everything. Talk about an illustration of completeness with this miracle. The totality of God's provision of spiritual life to everyone who believes. Jesus gives us everything that we need and more. In our humanness, it's natural for us to doubt and to focus in on what our five senses are telling us because we're in this body of flesh. All of us have physical needs. God knows that we do and he does have compassion for us. But our physical troubles here are only temporary. My friends, Jesus wants us to take our eyes and focus them on him. The big picture of eternity. And understand that Jesus is not just Lord over the circumstances on the world right now. He is Lord over all. He's Lord over eternity. 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 and 4. Jesus, this is is what, what Peter wanted us to know. His divine power, Jesus' divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through him he has given us a very great and pre- uh, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. This is the beauty of Jesus revisiting the miracle of provision. God has given us everything we need in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. But human nature, (laughs) human nature. So these 4,000 people are fed seven basketfuls of food left over. What Mark writes next, verse 11 of our text, it's perplexing. What does it say here? The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. Can you believe that? What was just given? They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply. Oh. Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. After seeing miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, all of the people, and, and the Pharisees included, even some of the elect of Christ had a difficulty Seeing what he was up to. What what was he trying to teach them? (laughs) What Jesus was actually trying to teach them is recorded in John chapter 6, 35 to 40. And Jesus said this. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I have told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. You see the hope here? For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. This is the glory of God. This is the plan of the Lord Jesus Christ in showing these miraculous miracles of feeding the multitudes. See, not only is the but not only is the lack of faith on the part of the Pharisees perplexing, (laughs) the twelve disciples. They had some real struggles with understanding what Jesus was trying to say with this. I mean, this was early in the the ministry. Like, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet and raised from the dead yet. So they're looking looking at this without that as their backdrop, right? But 
Verse 13, the narrative continues. Then he left them, to, got back in the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. They'd just been speaking with the Pharisees. And out of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do your eyes fail to see? And, and ears have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the low, five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? He answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? In Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 27, Jesus tells all of us, he says this, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You see, our enemy wants us to be so consumed over the brokenness of our circumstances, over our hunger sometimes, over the suffering that we have, that we forget the everlasting promises of God. And thankfully, by the grace of God, he sees us where we are and knows how weak we are in our flesh. And he repeats himself, emphasizing what he wants us to understand. You know, when Jesus himself was being tempted by the devil out in the wilderness, by Satan in the wilderness, it says that he'd fasted for a long time, right? 40 days. <laughs> he'd fasted. He was hungry. His physical body was crying out for food. And what did Satan do? He tried to get Jesus to turn his attention from what he was doing to filling his belly and meeting the, 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 the physical need that was crying out to him. Satisfy your hunger at the expense of something else. But rather than letting his discomfort of his physical circumstances dominated his thinking, Jesus replied to Satan in Matthew chapter 4, 4, saying, It is written, A man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Jesus knows, my friends, in this realm, that we're going to have trouble. We're going to have trouble. We're going to suffer. He understands the feelings of our weakness. But he wants us to see the big picture in all of this. He performed these physical miracles and gave us stories in the Bible that we could follow, demonstrating the fact that he is Lord over all circumstances. He is Lord of eternity and has final say over how the story will unfold. We're called to remember him today. Remember him whom we serve and the authority that he has. In closing, I'm just going to read one scripture and I'd like you to think about this throughout the next week. John 16.33 says this, I have told you these things so that in you, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world.
Aren't you glad that the master is in control? Let's bow in prayer.